London was the first city in the world to have an underground railway. What started as just 3 miles 59 chains of steam worked line back in 1863 has grown into a vast network which is used by thousands of daily passengers. In this program we will be looking back and by using unique archive film we will see some of the trains which have operated the system in the past. We start our journey at Farringdon, which was the eastern extremity of the Pioneer Metropolitan Railway when it opened from Paddington on the 10th of January 1863. A new street level building by C.W. Clark was erected in 1922 when the station was renamed from Farringdon Street to Farringdon and High Hoban. The suffix was officially dropped in 1936 but remains visible together with other items of historic interest. The Metropolitan, together with the slightly later Metropolitan District Railway, was constructed by the cut and cover method, with stations often built to impressive proportions. Steam trains have long since ceased to serve Farringdon, but occasionally specials have been operated for enthusiasts. This is former Metropolitan Railway 044 tank number L44 passing through in the 1950s. Followed by electric locomotive number 16 Oliver Goldsmith. By this time Hammersmith and City and Circle Line services were generally worked by units of the COCP type. This is 044 tank number L46 at Edgware Road whilst working another special. Like number L44, she was a member of the E-Class, which was designed by T.F. Clark and introduced in 1897. Locomotives of this type were originally used for passenger traffic and the class leader, number one, was chosen to haul the first Metropolitan train to Uxbridge in 1904. Baker Street has always been one of the busiest stations on the Metropolitan system and became a junction from the 13th of April 1868 with the opening of the line to Swiss Cottage. This was extended to West Hampstead in 1879 and by 1892 had reached Aylesbury. Until the early 1960s, many of the services over this section were worked by ex-Metropolitan Railway electric locomotives or sets of slam-door T-stops. As traffic increased, the two tracks between Baker Street and Finchley Road became very congested, so on the 20th of November 1939, an extension of the Bakerloo line was opened to relieve the pressure. This resulted in the closure of the intermediate stations, including Marlborough Road, which is now used as a restaurant. Moving down the line, we pause at Kilburn to watch a passing train of tea stock before arriving at Wilsdon Green with its fine C.W. Clark building from 1925. Bakerloo line trains were extended to Stanmore in 1939 and ran alongside Metropolitan services between Finchley Road and Wembley Park. This is E-Class number L48 on an enthusiast special.
electric locomotive number 18 Michael Faraday passes through followed by a train of 1938 stock on the Bakerloo line the late 1930s saw the introduction of some new trains on the subsurface routes Q38 stock was introduced on the district line whilst O and P units entered traffic on the Metropolitan At Dollis Hill, where the station was rebuilt in the autumn of 1938, a train of ex-district railway F-stock passes through. These units were introduced in 1920 and were nicknamed Tanks. This is followed by one of the Metropolitan Electric locomotives of a type constructed by Vickers Limited between 1921 and 1923. These engines were shedded at Neesden, as were a number of steam locomotives, although by the 1950s these were chiefly used on engineers' trains. Here, E-Class number L46 shunts in the yard. L44 of the same type has since been purchased for preservation and restored into its old metropolitan livery. Number L53 was a Peckett saddle tank built for shunting in 1897. The F class were 062 tanks built by the Yorkshire Engine Company in 1901. This one survived until the late 1950s. Around this time, LT acquired the first of its ex-Great Western pannier tanks. In addition to locomotives, Neesden accommodated both tube and subsurface units. Continuing our journey, we reached Wembley Park, where the station was rebuilt in 1923. Nearby stand the surviving buildings from the 1924 British Empire exhibition, including the famous stadium, which in 2000 was due for redevelopment. The old District Railway F stock began working on the Metropolitan in September 1950 and was often employed on Uxbridge services. T-stock was generally used on the Watford line, whilst electric locos worked the Aylesbury route as far as Rickmansworth. T-stock was a familiar sight on the Metropolitan line, as were the flare-sided cars of the COCP type. The branch to Stanmore diverges to the northwest of Wembley Park. It was opened by the Metropolitan Railway on the 10th of December 1932, but became part of the Bakerloo Line in 1939. From a stationary enthusiast special, we watch a train of 1938 tube stock travelling towards Elephant and Castle. The different vehicle within the formation is a trailer dating from 1927. On the approach to Stanmore, we pass a derailed train in one of the sidings.
Adjoining the depot lies Stanmore Station with its single island platform. After the departure of a Bakerloo line service train, the loco of our special, number one, John Lyon, runs around its stock. The Bakerloo ceased to work into Stanmore from the 1st of May 1979 when services were transferred to the Jubilee Line. Back to the Metropolitan, we move on to Northwick Park and view trains in the early 1950s. The brown liveried tea stock had its origins in the mid 1920s. At Harrow on the Hill, where station rebuilding was carried out between 1939 and 1948, an F stock train is seen heading south. We move on to Northwood Hills, where a British Railways standard Class 5460 passes with a train for Marylebone. The next station is Northwood, where the platforms were laterally recited in 1962 when the formation was widened to take four tracks. The old 1887 platforms stood beside the present fast lines and all traces of them have disappeared. Another station substantially rebuilt at the time was Moore Park. This is Metropolitan Electric Loco No. 5 John Hampton with a train for Baker Street. Work is underway on the demolition of one of the old wooden platforms as a train of F stock arrives on a Watford service. During this period, COCP trains were seen at Moore Park, together with the indigenous Metropolitan Tea Stock. Time was running out for locomotives such as number 7 Edmund Burke as a new A stock was being delivered to replace them.
Diesel multiple units started to appear on Marylebone Suburban services in January 1961 and took over completely from the 18th of June 1962. T-Stock continued to operate until Friday the 5th of October 1962 when it was last used in public service. Electrification was extended to Rickmansworth in 1925, but got no further until the early 1960s. Therefore, an engine change had to be made on all trains serving Aylesbury. Some stopping services on the Great Central Line also called at Rickmansworth and were hauled by a variety of locomotives, including BR Class 3 260s. Number 3, Sir Ralph Verney, arrives from Baker Street. The bridge to the south of the station provided an excellent location for viewing train movements. Electric locomotive number four was named Lord Byron and remained in service until the 22nd of January 1962. On arrival at Rickmansworth, Lord Byron is detached and replaced by Fairburn 264 tank number 42250. Number 4 then goes into a siding to wait for the next up train which it will take on to Baker Street. Meantime, number 42250 sets off for Aylesbury.
Chalfont and Latimer is junction for the single track Chesham branch, which opened on the 8th of July 1889. In BR steam days, the push pull branch trains were often worked by ex Great Central 442 tanks. The vintage Metropolitan coaches used on this service are now preserved on the Bluebell Railway in Sussex. With its rural surroundings, the branch epitomised the outer reaches of Metroland. Electrification reached Chesham on the 12th of September 1960 and the steam shuttle service was withdrawn. For a while, T-Stock and Metropolitan Electric locomotives appeared on the branch. Number 5, John Hampton, is seen on a peak hour through train. There was no run-round facilities at Chesham, so a loco had to be available to take the stock back out. Aylesbury was the terminus of London transport services from Baker Street until 10th of September 1961. Here, a Fairburn 264 tank brings a train of dreadnought coaches into the bay platform. After full electric services were introduced, Amersham became the terminus for LT trains. A special was operated in May 1963 as part of the Metropolitan Centenary celebrations, however, and was worked into Amersham by number five, John Hampton. The loco was then detached and replaced by Stania Jubilee Class 460 number 45709 Implacable, which hauled the stock to Aylesbury and back. At the time, the new electric and diesel units could be seen at the station. Photographers waited for Implacable to return. She was then taken off and John Hampton took over for the remainder of the trip, which was to Baker Street via Watford. John Hampton is now preserved in the London Transport Museum at Covent Garden. The old Metropolitan Electric locos were placed into storage at Neasden and the majority were later scrapped. In April 1963, prior to the centenary celebrations, loco number one John Lyon, stripped for repainting, 
ran light through Barking to pick up some dreadnought coaches which were stored at Upminster. Happily, number 12, Sarah Siddons, remains in working order and is sometimes used on special trains. London Transport continued to use steam for departmental use until June 1971. The locomotives were ex-Great Western 57 XX pannier tanks which had been acquired from BR in the late 1950s and early 1960s. The last regular duty for these engines was hauling spoil trains between Neesden and Croxley Tip. Here, a train is seen arriving at the tip. Number L89 was sold to the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway for preservation in 1970. Acton Town Station is served by both District and Piccadilly lines and in the 1950s was a good location for photography. The gleaming new 1956 stock which entered Piccadilly line service on the 9th of September 1957 makes an interesting contrast with earlier units in their traditional livery of red. The difference in height between subsurface district stock and Piccadilly line tube trains is very evident. The 1956 units were prototypes for new trains introduced three years later and attracted a lot of attention at the time. From 1938, the short district line branch linking Acton Town with South Acton was worked by specially converted double-ended Q23 cars. The line opened to passengers on the 13th of June 1906, but closed in 1959. It stretched for just 1,232 yards and had been single track since 1932. 
Branch trains headed east from Acton Town and paralleled the main district and Piccadilly formation before curving northwards towards the bridge over Bollow Lane. The terminus at South Acton was a very simple affair and comprised a single platform. Originally the branch provided a link with what is now the North London Line, but the connection was severed in 1930 and buffer stops erected. Just before closure some of the LT roundels were pasted over. Here, two bullet Q1s run light past the adjoining BR station. North London Line passenger services were then operated by Vintage Electrics, such as this ex-LNWR Ehrlichan unit. The journey was so short that it was claimed a return trip could be made before the mess room kettle boiled back at Acton Town. Apart from the tea run, the district shuttle service was also referred to as the pony or the ginny. Happily, the North London line is still with us, but apart from a bridge abutment in Bollow Lane and an abandoned platform at Acton Town, the old district branch has largely disappeared. We bid farewell to this route as we follow Ginny on her run back into Acton Town. We now move to the northern end of the Piccadilly line to see standard stock in operation during the 1950s. The route between Finsbury Park and Arnos Grove was opened on the 19th of September 1932. Moving to the east end, we see a Q23 car leading a district train into Whitechapel. There were originally two station entrances here, but these were amalgamated in 1904 when the district building closed. The present entrance was constructed to serve the East London Railway and opened in 1876. From the northern end of Shoreditch station, it is still possible to see where this line once joined the Great Eastern. At the southern end of the East London line, trains terminate at New Cross and New Cross Gate. The East London line was electrified in 1913 and was subsequently absorbed into the underground system. This is ex-Metropolitan Railway number 16 Oliver Goldsmith visiting with an enthusiast special. During the 1950s, services were operated by trains of F-stock with their distinctive oval front windows. These cars, which had been built by the Metropolitan Carriage Wagon and Finance Company, last worked over the East London line in September 1963. The service then passed to trains of Q-stock as seen here at New Cross. 
These sets included vehicles which had been built at various dates between 1923 and 1938. we arrive at Surrey Docks and watch Oliver Goldsmith pass through with its returning special. This is followed by four car formations of F stock. The distinctive Q23 cars started life as G-Stock. Q-Stock was withdrawn in 1971 and replaced on the East London line by COCP trains which had previously worked on the Hammersmith and City and Circle. were in turn replaced by four car sets of 1938 tube stock in 1974. For three years the tube cars were taken off and A stock was introduced. views of D-stock on the line are also rare. Occasionally other types of train have appeared on the East London line, such as this diesel multiple unit which was on loan from BR for track recording purposes in the early 1990s. Shoreditch station is not in use, East London line trains terminate at Whitechapel low level. Here we join a special train formed of A-stock and travel southwards with the train lights extinguished to aid photography. station beyond Whitechapel is Shadwell, which opened with the northern stretch of line on the 10th of April 1876. Wapping, which opened as the temporary northern terminus of the line on 7th of December 1869. South of here, the route passes through the Thames Tunnel, which opened for pedestrians in 1843 and was converted for railway use in the 1860s. It was designed by Sir Mark Brunel and constructed largely under the supervision of his famous son Isambard. Soon after leaving the Thames Tunnel, our train reaches Rotherhithe. The East London line was closed between 1995 and 1998, whilst refurbishment was carried out, most notably beneath the river. 
Here we alight and return to Wapping. The route between Moorgate and Finsbury Park is now served by mainline suburban trains, but until the autumn of 1975 it was part of London Transport. Adjoining Drayton Park Station was once a depot, but this was demolished in 1979 and the surviving remnants are now largely hidden beneath foliage. The line was opened by the Great Northern and City Railway on the 14th of February 1904 and was the only London tube to be built large enough to take conventional rolling stock. This is the frontage of Drayton Park Station in London transport days with part of the depot roof visible nearby. Under a 1930s plan, services were to be extended over the LNER to destinations such as Highgate and Alexandra Palace. A new signal box was brought into use in March 1939 and the southbound ramp completed, but unfortunately the scheme became moribund after the onset of war. For many years conventional height vehicles were used on the line but standard tube stock was introduced in May 1939. These trains continued in service until 1966 when they were replaced by 1938 stock as seen here. This unit is being taken out of service with an electrical fault. From the 4th of October 1964 until the advent of BR operation, Drayton Park was used as a northern terminus of the route as the section to Finsbury Park was closed in connection with Victoria Line construction. A Class 55 Deltic diesel passes on the BR tracks above. To access the depot, trains had to run a short distance towards Finsbury Park, then reverse. This view shows the close proximity of the depot to the station.
by this time the 1939 signal box was in its final days. To transfer stock between Drayton Park and Highgate depots, the cars had to be hauled by battery locomotives, generally with one at each end. This is number L21, which was built in 1964. Trains for transfer would reverse into the station and gain access to the only ramp which was then in operation. Parts of the old Great Northern Line were later deemed unsafe, so transfer trips to and from Highgate ceased in September 1970. After this, stock for servicing would travel between Drayton Park and Neasden by way of King's Cross and the city widen lines. This is the final run, worked by battery locos number L44 and L21. Battery loco number L57, seen here on transfer duty, was built by R.Y. Pickering of Wishaw in 1951. We leave the subject of Northern City Line stock transfers with this nostalgic view of three 1938 stock cars headed by number L21 on the now lifted route between Highgate and Finsbury Park. The old track bed is now a public footpath known as Parkland Walk. Although the depot site lies deserted and derelict, the pre-war scheme to link the Great Northern and City with the main line was at last realised in 1976, even if in a different form to that originally envisaged. The northbound ramp was never completed under the pre-war scheme, but now there is proper access from both directions. We now move to the London and North Western Railway near Harrow. In 1915, the Bakerloo was extended alongside the line between Queen's Park and Willesden, then two years later was continued to Watford Junction. The new electrified tracks were shared with the LNWR. Jointly owned tube stock was ordered in 1914, but the intervention of war brought a delay of six years. Therefore, until 1920, the service was provided by cars borrowed from the Central London Railway. The Ehrlichan sets of the LNWR looked particularly attractive in their original livery of plum and spilt milk. They also looked good in fully lined LMS maroon, as seen here at Harrow and Wheelstone in early post-war days. By this time, Bakerloo line services were worked by 1938 stock. These trains remained on the Bakerloo until the 1980s and continued to work alongside BR units on the Watford route. We will now 
now take a look at the central line. On the 28th of July 1912, the Central London Railway was extended eastwards from Bank to Liverpool Street. This remained the terminus of the line for many years, although the new works plan announced in the mid-1930s envisaged the line being continued into Essex. The tracks would be carried in newly constructed tubes until reaching Stratford and remain in tunnel until approaching Leighton, where they would join the former Great Eastern route to Onga. Completion was delayed by the Second World War, but eventually, on the 4th of December 1946, Central Line tube trains reached Stratford. The following year they reached Leightonstone, where the station had been extensively rebuilt after air raid damage. Standard tube stock was employed from the outset and remained a familiar sight on the main central line until being replaced by new units towards the end of 1962. Although electrified, the old Great Eastern route retained much of its earlier character. At Newbury Park, the tube tunnels surfaced either side of the existing formation. South Woodford Station opened as George Lane in 1856, but was later subject to various rebuildings. It received its present name on the 5th of July 1937, although its earlier title has been retained as a suffix on some of the platform name boards. A few early morning passenger services remained steam hauled into the 1950s, as did the freight trains. Nineteen thirty five units were the forerunners of nineteen thirty eight stock, and some of these were converted into two car sets for use on the Woodford Hainault shuttle during nineteen fifty and fifty one. However, standard stock continued to be used on the main central line. The two-car shuttles were subsequently increased to three by the addition of a 1927 trailer. The underground reached Debden on the 25th of September 1949 when electrification was extended to Epping. London underground services to Onga have now faded into history, as have the majority of the subjects seen in this programme. However, thanks to the efforts of dedicated photographers, these vanished scenes have been recorded for posterity.